this chapter, we're going to cover both the federal and the state judicial process. The federal court system looks like this. You can see down at the bottom are courts of general jurisdiction. So these courts down here, the U.S. Tax Court, the Territorial Courts, the 94 District Courts, and the Court of the District of Columbia are cases or courts where federal cases will originally be brought. There's a few that are lower. You see appeals from high estate courts down there and appeals from federal regulatory agencies, but we're not really going to worry too much about those. So this bottom four category and also military courts hear cases for the first time, cases of first impression. After that, after those cases happen, if, if the parties wish to appeal, they would appeal to the courts of appeals. And there are 12 U.S. courts of appeals, and the, the court you would appeal to depends on your location. There's also a court of military appeals. If your original case was brought in a military court, you'll appeal to the U.S. Court of Military Appeals. And then above that is the Supreme Court, and that's, of course, your last resort. That's the last place you can appeal. And the Supreme Court's a little bit different because they don't take every appeal. They're not required to take every case that is appealed to them. They get to choose the cases they take by issuing a writ of certiorari. And again, the federal court system is generally divided into three levels, district courts, courts of appeals, and the Supreme Court. The district courts are the lowest level in the federal system. There's 94 judicial district courts in the 50 states and the territories. And the court where you would bring your case would depend on where the, the court that has jurisdiction, which often depends on where the action happened. These courts have no appellate jurisdiction, and they have a general original jurisdiction over most cases. Next are the appeals courts. They're the intermediate level courts. There are 12, including the D.C. Circuit Courts, and they have no original jurisdiction. You can't ever just file suit in a court of appeal. They have appellate jurisdiction. And finally, the Supreme Court. It's the highest court in the federal system. There are nine justices meeting in D.C. Appeals jurisdiction through certiorari process, and they have limited original jurisdiction over some cases. If some question is so important and has never been answered, they may take it on original jurisdiction, but it's very, very rare. So jurisdiction means the power of a court to hear a case. I can't go to just any court I want to and file any case I want to. Courts can only hear certain cases. And like we talked about with the district courts and the appellate courts, there's original and appellate jurisdiction. Original jurisdiction means that a court can hear a case for the first time. So those are our district courts. Appellate jurisdiction means that the courts are reviewing the decision of a lower court. So they can review for errors of law. So ignoring the facts, they can say the law was misapplied in the case. That's plenary review. They can appeal for misapplication of, of facts. That should say misapplication of facts. That's a clearly erroneous standard. And they can appeal because they can say that the judge abused his or her authority. That's abuse of discretion. All right, and there are four different types of jurisdiction. General jurisdiction means a court can hear any type of case. Special jurisdiction means courts can hear only certain types of cases. So you, as you probably saw right here on the bottom, almost left, there's a U.S. tax court. They can only hear tax court cases. There's a military court. They can only hear cases involving military claims. That would be a, a type of special jurisdiction. The 94 district courts have general jurisdiction. They can hear any type of case. And then there's subject matter jurisdiction, so authority over a particular type of case. And then there's personal jurisdiction, authority over a particular party to the case. For a federal court to be able to hear a case, they have to have both personal and subject matter jurisdiction. So we'll start with subject matter jurisdiction. To have subject matter jurisdiction, it has to involve a federal question or it has to be a diversity case. So one of the two will give you subject matter jurisdiction. A federal question is going to involve the Constitution, a federal statute or statutes, or a treaty. 
And state law issues could be included in there as long as there's a federal question that's part of the claim. So that's a federal question. A diversity case is a lawsuit that's between citizens of different states, between citizens of a state or different states and citizens of a foreign nation, or between citizens of a state and a foreign government as the plaintiff. These types of cases also have to involve amounts over $75,000. So again, for a federal court to hear a case, you have to have personal jurisdiction and subject matter jurisdiction. To have subject matter jurisdiction, the case has to either involve a federal question or be a diversity case. <clears throat> to have personal jurisdiction, you use the, long, the state's long-arm statute plus minimum contacts. And a state's long-arm statute says that the federal district court sitting in that state would have jurisdiction if the person, a member of the party, a, a party to the lawsuit, owned real estate in the state, solicited business in the state, had an office or a store in the state, committed a tort within the state, or transacted business in the state. Most of the time that's pretty clear. If you have an office in the state, you have made minimum contacts in the state. So minimum contacts means, does the individual have enough contact with the state to satisfy the requirement? So like we said, if you own a house in the state, you definitely have minimum contacts. But transacting business in the state is a little bit differently. If you're just driving through on your way to another state and you stop and fill up with gas, did you transact enough business in the state to be subject to a lawsuit in the state? So minimum contacts comes into play there. So again, to have federal jurisdiction, you have to have, the court has to have both personal and subject matter jurisdiction. The U.S. Supreme Court is the court of final jurisdiction. It has one chief justice and eight justices. You only get to be heard by the Supreme Court if the Supreme Court issues a writ of certiary, and they generally hear cases involving large numbers of people affected by an issue of federal law. Moving to the state court system, they're all different, but they generally all have the same three levels of courts that the federal court government has. So they have trial courts, intermediate courts, and supreme courts. Now, the names of these courts vary by state, but they, they have three distinct purposes. Trial courts have general jurisdiction and they're bound by location. So if I have an issue solely of state law, it happened in Texas, and both parties live in Texas, I can't file that lawsuit in Florida. They don't have jurisdiction, they're bound by location. And then if I wanted to appeal, I would appeal to the intermediate and then the Supreme Courts. Okay, and we're going to move into procedure. So there's different procedure based on if you're bringing a civil claim or a criminal claim. A civil claim, the goal of that would be to punish an individual wrongdoer financially, so to get monetary recovery. These are things like violations of contracts. These are things that don't involve crimes, but they involve loss. That's a civil lawsuit, and this is the procedure to bring a civil action. I'm going to cover this fairly quickly because it's not complicated and it's well defined in your book. So first you commence the action. You commence the civil complaint, the civil suit by filing a complaint. And a complaint is going to state the names of the people in the suit, identify their roles, and include basically the facts of the case, the violations of the defendant, any injuries that were suffered, and then what the plaintiff wants as recovery. So the plaintiff is the one that brings the case. The defendant is the one being sued. You could also bring a class action case if there is... if. A large number of individuals are harmed by a single action. That's a class action. In class action, sometimes we have forum shopping where they look for a jurisdiction to bring the case that has the best law, so the most favorable law. And in a class action, we can do a little bit of forum shopping because if, if the class is large enough, they probably have jurisdiction in many different areas. After the action is commenced with a complaint, we have service of process. So 
Basically, everyone who is a party to the suit is informed of the suit, what it's about, the charges, and how to respond. After that, you're in the pre-answer stage. In that stage, you can prepare an answer to the suit. You might file motions to dismiss, and you might file motions to request an extension. Finally, you would file the answer to the lawsuit, and the answer would either admit or deny the claims in the lawsuit. It might also set forth affirmative defenses. Affirmative defenses say, even if everything in this complaint is true, I'm still not liable because of other factors. After you file your answer, you're in the pre-trial stage. This is where you gather all of your evidence through discovery. You also have pre-trial conferences with all parties, and then you usually issue motions, file motions during this stage. So motion to dismiss, motion for summary judgment, things like that. Finally, you get to the trial, and if you're not happy with it, you can appeal. After all the appeals have run out, there's an execution of judgment, a writ of execution. It provides for the recovery, the financial recovery in the, in the lawsuit. We also have cyber procedure, which is really a developing area of the law. It's not, it's not well defined. So cyber jurisdiction says whether a court can hear a case based on online transactions alone. And this is becoming increasingly important. Your Amazons of the world that don't have any physical locations. If I were to sue an Amazon, where would I do that? So if the whole transaction happens online, like Amazon, from order fulfillment from order to order fulfillment, minimum contacts are established in the buyer's state. So I can definitely sue Amazon in Texas if I live in Texas and place the order online. If it's just an inactive advertisement that a business placed on the internet and I didn't really make an online order and it wasn't fulfilled solely on the internet, then that company has not made minimum contacts with buyer's state. So if I am in Texas and I see an inactive ad on the internet and I respond to that ad, if that company is located somewhere else, they haven't, just by virtue of placing the ad on the internet, established minimum contacts with Texas. So those are both ends of the spectrum, and all of the middle is really still evolving. We don't really have an answer for everything in the middle. Cyber filing, most courts now require electronic filing for all motions, complaints, etc., and then cyber discovery. <clears throat> discovery used to be easy. You'd get a box of documents and you'd look through them, read them, flag what's important. Now discovery is a lot harder because we're creating huge amounts of information with our online records. So discovery of electronic records is very complicated because of that huge volume and means of storage. This type of electronically generated knowledge is called electronically stored information. And it's really an area of law that's still evolving. Finally, criminal procedure. So criminal procedure is different than civil procedure because the goals of the suit are different. The goal of a criminal proceeding is to punish crimes against society. And that punishment could be a fine or it could be prison. So I can personally go out and file a civil lawsuit. If somebody breaks into my house, I can't personally go out and file a criminal lawsuit. I can't press criminal charges against them. The, the prosecutor has to do that for me. Um, it's Because it's a crime against society, then our governing bodies have to bring those lawsuits. All right, they start first with an arrest and initial appearance. The defendant would be informed of their rights, brought before a judge for an initial appearance, and they'd have a preliminary hearing or excuse me, they would set the preliminary hearing. Then they would have the preliminary hearing. And in the preliminary hearing, the judge is going to decide whether to continue holding the defendant. If there's no probable cause, the defendant will be released. Then the, the formal charges are brought, and that's by either an indictment or an information. These are the same, the same result happens with either of these. And an indictment is a set of formal charges against a defendant issued by a grand jury. And the grand jury's job is to look at all of the facts that, that have been brought to light thus far and assume them all true. So if we assume all the facts are true, are there enough elements of a crime that this person could be guilty? 
So it's a really low standard. Finding someone should be indicted is a pretty low standard. The information is the same thing, except it is brought by a prosecutor or district attorney. And then the arraignment. The defendant hears the indictment and information and enters a plea of either guilty or not guilty. And finally, we get to trial. And it could be a jury trial or a bench trial. A jury trial, of course, has a jury of your peers. A bench trial is just before a judge or a panel of judges. For a criminal to be found guilty, the burden of proof is higher than for a civil lawsuit. To be found criminally liable, a person must be guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. For a civil lawsuit, it's usually by a preponderance of the evidence or something like that. So just to refresh, we discussed the courts, the structure of the federal and state courts, and then we talked about procedure, civil, criminal, and cyber procedure. Civil procedure covers instances where a suit is brought and the recovery is going to be monetary. These are things like breach of contract. Criminal procedure deals with crimes against society. The district attorney and prosecutor bring these types of cases, and punishment can be fine or imprisonment. And then we discuss cyber procedure and how it is an evolving area of the law.